which stocks and bonds have been in the most demand from securities borrowers, and how much money have lenders made. The third quarter of 2022 is now complete, and today I'm going to share securities lending performance data for the quarter, including highlighting the highest revenue generating securities for the period. And I'm also going to review my own projections for what I expect the Q3 to look like, so hang on to the end to see how my predictions turned out. So if securities lending is your thing, if you're a lender, a borrower, an intermediary, a vendor, or just plain interested, then this is the place for you. So let's get started. Here we are in the fourth quarter of 2022. As I said in this video, I'm going to look at the securities lending market performance for the past quarter. What's up, what's down, and what are the trends? Also, some viewers have asked me to provide more information on specific performance by security, so I've included more granular level information than I usually do. I also did a performance related video at the end of the first half of 2022 and provided my views on what I expected to see in the second half of the year. I'll put a link to that video in the show description. But look, I'll also revisit the comments uh, that I made and see whether I was on target or way offline. So hang on to the end of the video. For this video, I'll be using data that I've sourced from the usual suspects, Data Lend, S&P Global Securities Finance, and S3 Partners, and I appreciate the data that they make publicly available. Before I get started, if you find this video helpful, I'd appreciate it if you can give it a thumbs up and maybe share it with people that you think might also get some value from it. Okay, here we go. First, the headlines. As you can see in the graph that I created from the S&P data, Q3 was the highest securities lending revenue generating quarter of the year, reaching $3.383 billion, just beating Q2 by about half a percent. And that makes a total for the year to date of just a touch under $9.5 billion, which means we're on pace for one of the best years ever for lending revenues. And as an aside, if you're not a dollar-based investor, given the strength of the dollar, uh, you're likely to be having your best year ever already. Well, for lending revenues, that is, uh, because given the stock and bond market performance for the year, you could probably do with some positive return news somewhere. Data Lend separates the lender to broker revenues, whereas S&P aggregates the data. So Data Lend reported that lender to broker third quarter revenues were $2.63 billion, up 12% over the same period in 2021 with the total year to date as 7.45 billion, 8% higher than Q3's total last year. So where did that increase come from? Well, S&P tells us that North American equities were the main engine for growth and they were generating 49% of all equity revenues, shooting to a total of 1.49 billion for the quarter, up almost a quarter of a billion dollars over Q2 and up over 50% over Q1. Here's the S&P top 10 revenue generators, America's equities, September 2022. Now you can see that 3M is at the top of the list. Uh, they did a spin-off of their food safety business with investors who tendered their shares, getting Neogen shares. But look, that's a one-off transaction that generated about $20 million in fees in a very short period of time but uh, don't expect to see that one again next month. Now, interestingly, with the 3M revenues, S&P reports just over $20 million, whereas Data Lend shows $31 million, which is a surprisingly big difference. Now look, this shows you that although data is data, each pricing provider has its own client base, although they substantially overlap, uh, and each calculates figures in a similar, but not identical way. It's still almost entirely science, but there is an element of art to it. We also see a couple of the meme stock favorites, AMC and GameStop making appearances on the list. And all favorites uh, include EVs, Lucid and Fisker, as well as a big stock for the month. Uh, what, that was, it was a stock that was really in quite a lot of demand a few years ago, Sirius XM. And Beyond Meat is there again. Actually, I had a Beyond Meat burger for the first time a couple of weeks ago, and I really liked it, and I love burgers. But 
Irrespective of how much I like burgers, uh, they have just announced uh, staff cuts of 20% of its workforce and they're facing extra pressure because inflation means that alternative, <laughs> alternatives to plants, i.e. meat, uh, provide cheaper forms of protein. So it looks like the shorts are hanging in for every last penny as the company's financials get even more stressed. According to the good people at S3 Partners, short interest in North American equities decreased by 5.8% in Q3, or 54.3 billion. That 54 billion was made up of 53.7 billion of share price decreases and just under 550 million of short covering. If you wanna get more granular though, S3 gives some fascinating information. In July, short sellers were busy covering short positions, and although the markets kept falling, people were looking for a floor in the market. August continued the short covering as some markets started to recover, but then bang, along comes September with new short positions of about $28.5 billion, which eclipsed the total combined short covering of the previous two months. I thought it might also be interesting for you to see the average borrow fees by sector for Q2 in the middle column and Q3 in the right-hand column. Rates are down across every segment. I guess it's less demand for the stocks, more supply, and that inevitably will push down rates. It'll be interesting to see uh, September split out versus August, but uh, that information is, isn't there. Interestingly, both European and Asian equities were down for the quarter compared to 2021, literally the only sectors that reported a drop in revenues. And for both, it was both revenues and balances that were down from last year's Q3. Now, Asia generated almost twice as much income as Europe, 179 million for Asia compared to 90 million for Europe. Now, Japan has always been amongst the biggest revenue sources for lenders, but in Q3, Japan generated 66 million, which was more than Germany, France, the UK, and Sweden combined, and they were the four biggest European markets. Here's the top Asian and European earners for September. The interesting thing here for me is that you can see that the top three European stocks all generated more than the largest Asian stocks. And that the top five European stocks generate more than 20% of all European equity revenues. Now, I don't wanna go off on a tangent here, but I might do a video on how short selling is tolerated in Europe, but it's not really accepted and that the regulations are biased against short sellers. That protects bad companies, in my opinion. It means European companies have less scrutiny from activist short sellers, who frankly are the real policemen of companies. Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and South Korea stocks all generated more lending revenue in September than any European market. And it's not because Asia has more dodgy companies than Europe. Maybe I'll cover that uh, subject sometime. What do you think? Before I move on to bonds, one of my previous podcast guests, uh, Fraser Pering, has been agitating about a Swedish stock, SBB, since publishing on it in February. I'll include the link to the podcast in the description where I spoke with Fraser about Wirecard, that fantastic German stock collapse of a few years ago. DataLend reports that government bond lending was up 16% year over year in Q3, and that figure was achieved through increased fees of 18%, uh, offset somewhat by an 11% drop in loan balances due to the drop in bond prices and closeouts of positions. Turning to the list of top five revenue generators from S&P, we see the top four being US Treasuries with number five being a British gilt bond. I wonder if we just might see a higher representation of gilts next time around, given the October turbulence in gilts. I mean, ironically, that may not be the case because the problem with gilts is the number, size, depth, and range of gilts themselves. Corporate debt showed up with some powerful revenues again with Datalend figuring the numbers as $182 million for the quarter, a 79% increase over the same period in 2021. And an interesting item that they point out is that fees went up across both high yield and investment grade, up 100% and 73% respectively. 
They also list the iShares iBox HYG as being the 11th largest earner for the quarter, which is unusual for an ETF to be up so high in the overall rankings. S&P reminds us that the Bloomberg Global Bond Aggregate measuring the prices of a basket of investment grade corporate bonds was down approximately 20% over the month of September. And of course, this is due to the expectation of central banks continuing to fight inflation with rising interest rates. One of the cool points S&P makes is that the top five earners are the same for August and September and contain a mix of convertibles and private placements rather than sort of the widely available uh, normal corporate bond market. Now, I promised you I would review my projections from the Q2 summary I did, so here we go. have continued to be volatile and trend downwards. So how did the figures come out? Well, balances at the end of September were 10% uh, down from the June month end. Revenues only dropped 5% because the hot stocks generating the highest fees continued to be borrowed, whereas for many other securities, traders have closed out their positions and taken profits. That's the approximately 550 million of reduced balances S3 reported that I referred to earlier. The quarter overall, as I said at the beginning of this video, was up ever so slightly over Q2. So I think I pretty much got that one. Balances were down 6%, but revenues were up 8%. So while it was a 50-50 call, I think I'm okay with getting the important figure right, income. The corporate bond revenue growth story will continue until uh, the central banks pivot and reduce rates in the face of a global recession. Oops, that's just what I expect to happen, not a fact-based comment. Government bond balances were down 10% even before the guilds debacle in October, but revenues are up 10%, so a similar story to corporate bonds. I think that government bond balances will increase in the final quarter, but look, I got it wrong here. The utilization of available government bonds was down 2% from the end of Q2 to uh, the end of Q3. But I think I'm gonna give myself the benefit of the doubt here as there is a little bit of a difference in terms of how uh, firms position their balance sheets at a half year as opposed to mid-year quarters. Uh, but look, if we stick to the facts, I'm wrong. And to be honest, I was pretty confident on this call. Balances are down 5% and revenues up over the previous quarter to a good finish. And I think overall, that's not a bad outcome for the projections I made in July. Let me know what you think though in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, tell me if you found the additional detail was worthwhile so that I can plan on including it next time. Uh, but that's it for me. I look forward to catching you next time.